Right, good evening everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, we are really thrilled uh, to have you all here and we are really grateful to the panel for making time to join us. Um, my name is Shamila Mohammed. I'm the Executive Director for Amnesty International South Africa. It gives me the, the greatest of pleasure to introduce uh, our panel today. Um, <clears throat> we have on my uh, uh, just in the picture right next to me, we have Professor Anne Skelton. Uh, she's an advocate at the Center for Child Law and a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of Children. Professor Skelton has been a human rights lawyer in South Africa for 25 years, specializing in children's rights. She was at the forefront of the child reform uh, through um, of child reform through the SA Law Reform Commission and is a professor of law at the University of Pretoria, where she holds the UNESCO Chair in Education Law in Africa. She's an advocate who has played a leading role in land landmark litigation, including education cases. She has published wild widely, both locally and internationally. In 2012, she was awarded the Honorary World's, Children, World's Children's Prize. She is currently a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and chaired the expert committee that drafted the Abidjan principles on state obligations regarding public education and the regulation of private education. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, we also have with us um, uh, um, Amanda Edwards. Thank you, Amanda, for joining us at such note, short notice. Amanda Edwards is a former speech and language therapist turned education researcher with over nine years experience working in public and private health and education sectors in South Africa, the United Kingdom and Thailand. Thailand. Amanda is recipient of the Margaret McNamara Education Grant and Harry Crosley Fellowship. Her current role is, is the education researcher and performance analyst at the Public School Pro Partnerships Program, a collaborative approach to public school innova innovation embedded in the DG Murray Trust that brings together government funders, no fee public schools, and non profit education support organizations. PSP currently works across two provinces, supporting 19 schools and over 10,000 learners in some of South Africa's poorest communities. Um, we were expecting to have the Amnesty International um, uh, Economic, Social, Cultural Rights researcher, um, Ian Byrne, joining us, but we're having some technical problems. Uh, if Ian does manage to uh, join us, then that would be uh, fabulous and it would be great to have him here. Uh, we are also expecting, um, um, you know, another speaker, um, who is from, um, okay, I, I'm going to let that go because I don't think that speaker is actually going to jo join us, but we were expecting Matakane and Matakana, uh, and we haven't been able to uh, get hold of him, but if he joins us uh, from NASGB, that would be also fabulous. So, um, you know, if they do join us, that would be great. It'll make the experience even uh, richer. Um, one of the reasons that we decided, uh, you know, uh, to to have a webinar uh, today was because Amnesty International uh, was, um, you know, we we had launched a report um, in twenty uh, last year in March last year, uh, which was called "Broken and Unequal," in which we looked at the education system um, in the Eastern Cape, but also in Kauteng, and that report was really uh, quite uh, frightening. And actually, the report didn't say anything that many other organizations had already uh, talked about. Uh, you know, it just in a way um, confirmed or, uh, you know, underscored some of the concerns uh, that many organizations had around the previously disadvantaged communities, around the inequality in education, around the fact that many, many of the schools in the poorer communities were not being given the attention that they deserved and that also the the the, the reality that um, you know that many of the children in those schools were not going to get the quality education that they deserved Ian welcome uh, so uh, we're very very happy to have you here Ian 
Um, so uh, for those um, who are watching, uh, Ian Byrne is the research and advisor at Amnesty International. Ian is a, in, an international human rights lawyer with over 25 years of experience of working in the field. Since November 2011, he has worked at the International National Secretariat of Amnesty International in the UK as a law and policy advisor and researcher in the economic and social justice, previously the economic, social and cultural rights team. Ian is actually the author of both the reports, the one that I was referring to earlier, which is um, uh, broken and unequal, and the one that we are launching today, and I'll let Ian speak uh, a bit to that. Ian, just for your information, Matakanya Matakanya has not joined us, and we are very fortunate uh, to have um, Amanda uh, Edwards, who is a, a specialist in education as well, um, you know, and she works uh, in the um, public and private health and education sectors. So she is uh, has kindly agreed to join us. Uh, but Ian, I'm going to hand over to you um, just to um, take us through our report that we're launching today. Thank you, Ian. Uh, well, thanks, Sheila. And I managed to... Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, well, uh, apologies for joining a bit late, but glad we could... Uh could sort it out. Um, and I'm very pleased that we are um, part of this conversation, this continued conversation about how to ensure that uh, all South African children have access to a, a decent education. As Shanilla said, and I managed to catch that bit of uh, intro, this, this report we just issued today really builds on the report that we issued a year ago. And the main message I suppose that we want to be saying today is it's very difficult, if not impossible, for many uh, schools in South Africa, particularly the the low the, the low fee schools, the, the the low quintile schools, to be able to guarantee a safe and adequate education for their children, because how can you socially distance in classrooms that we observed of sixty to seventy children? Uh, how can you guarantee uh, good hygiene when you don't even have running water, uh, when you don't have adequate sanitation? So I think as in many countries, uh, and we're looking globally at Amnesty International on many issues around COVID, uh, health, as well as education, as well as the right to work, COVID has merely exacerbated, has not it, uh, existing inequalities. Um, but that also provides us, I think, with opportunities for a bit of a reset. Uh, and that's really what we say in the report. We, we completely acknowledge that the government, as in many governments, including my own here in the UK, have faced many challenges with COVID. These are not easy challenges. Uh, but how you make decisions, uh, the decisions that you choose to make, the choices you choose to make, will obviously have consequences. And so the report that we issued this time drew a lot on statistical data, on um, parliamentary debates, studies, uh, surveys. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's based upon largely South African own research um, really sort of says that, um, you know, the risk of deepening inequality, if not addressed by the government, uh, is going to have a consequences probably for the entire generation. Uh, I think some of the recent stats said possibly uh, up to 600,000 uh, children at primary school level uh, have been effectively um, dropped out of school. Now, hopefully they will come back at some point. Obviously, lots of other students who haven't been able to matric. Over 1,700 teachers have died. Uh, in a in a profession where already there was there was real issues around teacher retention, and we might come on to discuss obviously some of these issues in the in the, in the debate. Um, so, you know, when you look at some of the choices the government's made, um, yes, it has provided some help with remote learning, but it seems to be quite limited and patchy. And again, you have to put that in the context of only ten percent of South African households having access to the internet about 20% having access to a computer. And these, of course, are the very communities, the very schools that are already going to be struggling on the infrastructure front. So you've got a double whammy, if you like. You've got these kids who are out of the education system, probably not getting any education uh, at all during the last year when schools have been shut. And then when schools reopen, are the schools geared up to protect them? Uh, you know, we obviously were able to monitor parliamentary debates, audits about issues around is there being enough PPE, uh, enough sanitizers, sort of the basic things that you need. And then on top of that, uh, you've got uh, obviously, as I said, these kind of 
existential, these ongoing infrastructure failings around the buildings, around the sanitation. And obviously the government uh, many times has promised to address some of these basic failings. We spelt that out in the previous report and it's been documented, as Shinella said, not just by us, but long before us, by, by many NGOs such as Equal Education, Section 27, academics like Anne, the Maui Trust. Um, but, but you're not seeing the change happen quickly enough. And I think at the height of the pandemic, when you see the government saying, we're going to divert, not only we're not going to spend it, education infrastructure grant, we're going to divert it to propping up South African Airways. Now, that's a debate that you can have. But obviously, those fundamentals about guaranteeing a future for South Africa's young people is obviously going to have consequences. Uh, the president's statement in October, uh, I think, was very welcome about addressing in the short to medium term some of these issues. But we're still looking 24 months or 36 months away to really get on top of things like pit toilets that we know are illegal, that we know the government has promised many, many times to eradicate, but are still there. We witnessed them. You know, when I was going around the country, when I could go around the country in 2018 and 2019, obviously seeing many... Uh, many schools in, in Hauteng and Eastern Cape, where we focused our research, still having really dreadful sanitation. Uh, as I said, and still having built buildings that are literally falling apart. And you can see some of the photographic evidence. And I think the, the thing of the picture speaks a thousand words. You can see in our report uh, many of the photographic evidence that we were able to document. So we are calling for a bit of a reset on the government. And again, we recognize the challenges that the government faces. But I think both on the remote learning front about using, looking at more innovative ways, certainly expanding those partnerships with some of the main broadcasters to ensure wider coverage, and then really using the opportunity to address some of this basic infrastructure, uh, I think is something that is vital. I'll just leave you with one statistic. So our report was delayed a little bit, but it did allow us to get in a survey that was conducted by five of the main teaching unions in January and that was a big survey, it was over 7,000 schools, and it showed that the majority, I think around about 55%, said they, the principal said they didn't feel safe opening their schools, both for their staff and for the learners. And again, I know there's been lots of debates around when, in fact, you know, it's happening now in the UK today about when schools should reopen. But if you're getting that level of anxiety, I think it does obviously suggest uh, that things need to change and change pretty quickly because again obviously that potentially will lead to a spread of covid uh, back out in the wider community with all of those public health concerns so i'll, I'll just leave it there um and obviously happy to discuss and, and take questions thanks great uh thank you so much ian um and uh you know our the report uh is available on our website and uh, it'll be available on all our social media um, channels, um, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Uh, so please do go there and download our report. Um, and um, yeah, so Anne, uh, Amanda, um, uh, well, Anne, let me open up to you. Um, yes. You know, is, yeah. Go ahead, well, thanks Anne. very much. Thank you, Shanila. And thanks, Ian, for giving us that intro. Um, it's great to see this very comprehensive report coming out actually so soon. Uh, you know, we're still counting the, the results. Uh, we're still kind of living in the pandemic and at the same time trying to assess what's been happening. You know, one of the things that I think uh, people like to talk nowadays about the new normal, but what this report really shows us is that for so many children in South Africa, what they're experiencing is the old normal, the old normal, but worse, <laughs> the old normal, but now more scary, more worrying because not being able to wash your hands or go to a decent toilet actually carries other risks than the usual risks that it carries. And so I think what we can see here is, um, as you say, um, and as everybody is talking about this exacerbation of existing inequalities. Um, and so that kind of leaves us with the question about whether this is a, a moment at which we could push government further. So, you know, some activists even um, want, were, were in the early stages when we were talking about kids going back to school, there was an element of, is this a moment 
as activists to say no children should go back to school and, until all of the schools are safe for children to go back. Now, I've, I've written elsewhere that I think that kind of all or nothing approach doesn't really work when you look at it from a child rights perspective. We've got to accept that we're living in a very um, fluid uh, environment nowadays. We all know that we can't plan properly, that we don't know what's happening in next week, that we, that we actually can't, we can't say uh, we'll hold back, we'll hold out until all schools have good sanitation. But on the other hand, is there a way to use this as an opportunity to um, play a bit of brinkmanship, I understand that that was what some of the activists were thinking. So it's like how to balance it to say, well, now, if there was ever a time when we need to uh, get government to really make good on its promises around sanitation, urgency, we have good grounds for urgency right now. So if government had committed to doing to fixing the sanitation for over 3,000 schools, but they themselves admit they've only made it in 200 and something schools, according to your figures in the report, and there are, it's government's own figures too. Um, is there something we can do with that then? Because surely we need to make greater efforts now to make sure that children are safe and that teachers are safe and that people have more confidence in going back to schools. Um, is this a moment to say overcrowding? in classrooms is unacceptable and we're having to do double shifts just to get decent sized classes. So doesn't that demonstrate for us what a huge need there is? And is government planning properly for dealing with those backlogs? Um, what can we do about holding government um, to account? All of that, of course, has to be discussed within a broader framework of understanding that government's under pressure on all fronts. Uh, and, and we get that. We understand that there are many um, priorities right now. Um, but I would go with the view, I, I, I'm happy to personally state that I don't think SAA is a priority right now. <laughs> and that education and sanitation in schools and getting poor schools somewhere closer um, to creating uh, a more equal system is very important. Sanitation is part of it, but then we also know that when it comes to um, electricity supply, there's a big problem. And also 72% um, of schools, the report says, don't have internet. So, I mean, this again is a missed opportunity because there's a, if you can't talk about increasing the use of online learning now, then, you know, it's going to be a huge lost opportunity. And I think there is a, a failure of the imagination here on, on what we could be doing with this opportunity. So um, I think the report, to some extent, tells us that, you know, the new normal is the old normal, uh, but worse. <laughs> but it also gives us some ammunition to think about how do we now push government? How do we now, um, you know, try to build on this opportunity, um, build it on the momentum that it possibly creates to say, it's now, it's now that it has to be done. So um, I'm, I'm bouncing that a little bit back at you, um, Ian, to see what your, your thoughts are on that. Um, and it will also be lovely to hear from Amanda on what she thinks about those ideas. Ian? Uh, well, I, I, we've said this quite often at Amnesty over the past year, and it sounds terrible given the toll of COVID, but it is an opportunity as well as a threat to think about a different way of doing things in government. And I think that's across the piece, as I said, whether it's in the healthcare systems uh, that maybe always weren't as prepared as they, as they should have been, or in education, or in social housing, whatever it is. And we know there's a whole range of economic, social and cultural rights that have been impacted both by COVID and government responses. So I, I totally agree with you, Anne, and obviously it's our job in civil society to always push government to do more, uh, whilst recognising uh, the, the constraints that they operate under. But as I said, you do have choices, 
even during a pandemic and even when you're fiscally uh, constrained. Uh, and you've always, I think, got to have a plan and you've got to have a strategy and a way out and you've got to set what we would say concrete human rights compliant targets, indicators, benchmarks, people have to monitor those. You know, it's not, it's not rocket science. I know, and I obviously I've learned a lot about South African education. That's the thing of being a global researcher. You know, I've learned a huge amount from so many people over doing over this work over the past couple of years and the context. Um, but, you know, it, it seems that, you know, the, the way that the provinces interact with the central government, the issues about the budgeting, uh, allocation of resources, you know, there's many, many issues, obviously, that we can't talk about on this call. But I think the bottom line is exactly as what you said, you know, uh, kids are just not getting the decent education. And of course, that's the future of the country as well as their own rights, you know, and you've got so many kids now out of education. Are they going to be out forever? What kind of education are they coming back to? What about all these kids that are not matricking? Um, you know, we've got, you know, it, it, it doesn't sound too dramatic, but potentially a lost generation. So I think, yeah, we have to be bold in civil society. We have to hold government's feet to the fire. Um, and, you know, and also, as you said, they have to move quicker on this because these issues have been around for decades. But now we're seeing during an, a public emergency in the country, what then the consequences Great, Ian, thank you. Um, Amanda, um, I'm going to bring you in now um, to respond to both Anne and uh, Ian, because I feel like Anne has raised some really pertinent questions uh, mm -hmm. around you know, the questions we need to ask, the priorities the government is, is making, choosing SAA over education. And of course, you know the, the, uh, uh, the title of our report is uh, failing to learn the lessons. Uh, it's a question. I mean, is the government failing to learn the lessons? And we look at the impacts of COVID on an already broken and unequal education system. System. So you've got some experience of being in the field. It would be really good to hear your thoughts on, you know, what, um, as Anne says, we need to think uh, creatively. We need to really, as Ian says, hold uh, hold uh, the, um, the the government's feet to the flames. I mean, what can we do to make them take this seriously? Thank you, Janela, and thank you, Ian and um, Anne, as well. This has just been a, a a great opportunity to review once again why why we need to stay on our toes as uh, public benefit organizations and as researchers. One of the things that COVID has really highlighted for me is the systemic fragility at multiple levels of the education system. <clears throat> Excuse me. And with that, the significant opportunity we have to think differently at those different levels, right down to the research that we do. Uh, how many times as researchers we've been told that our research takes too long? This report is evidence of the fact that we can provide evidence at the, to, the thing, to the people who need it most, um, when they need it most, um, for advocacy reasons and for decision-making reasons. In the public school partnerships program, when we had to watch our schools close, there wasn't a moment to, to spare. We had to pivot immediately. I think that's probably become the word of 2020 is pivot. And we were laughing earlier about saying that we've had to pivot so much, we're starting to get a bit of whiplash. Um, but the the thing that has really highlighted for me in this is this crisis is that the enormous resilience that is sitting with our our learners our schools our teachers to respond in some of the most dire circumstances um we have some schools in the eastern cape who are the schools that have been reported in in this report where we don't have access to remote learning strategies there aren't there isn't electricity there is no water supply so what do we do to to overcome that and i think the biggest thing that's raised for me is the opportunity to build new partnerships and strengthen old alliances and so building new partnerships with new remote learning platforms looking at how we can access people um, we've seen teachers go above and beyond the call of duty by reaching far beyond the classroom to go and find learners to deliver food parcels provide psychosocial support um, and and deliver remote learning um, one of our organizations in partnership with a high school here in Cape Town has been able to develop a remote learning platform that evolved from Facebook onto delivering lessons at less than 15 megabytes a day. Um, but across all of this has been the need to collect good quality, timely data as evidence for change um, and as evidence for the current status quo. And so I think for us, it's been really exciting to see what we can do in a crisis situation but also a real opportunity to point to those systemic fragilities where change is needed in the long term. 
Thank you, Amanda. Um, I'm going to, um, you know, questions have started coming in from the, the people listening. And I think, you know, I'm going to uh, start uh, throwing in a couple of questions. Uh, and, you know, uh, it would be great, Ian, Anne and Amanda, if, uh, you know, you could uh, speak to them, uh, as well as anything else you'd like to speak to with regards to the report or situation in the country. Uh, so the first question is, in his State of the Nation address, the president said, almost nothing about the dire state of education. How can we make the government take these educational issues seriously? Uh, that's a question that I posed earlier, but I was just wondering if the speakers uh, have any any direct answers uh, to, to this question. Anne, you're on mute. Yeah, I think one of the issues that um, that, that comes up is, you know, we there's a, there's a lot of information. This report adds to a body of information that is out there. There was also a very uh, good report by Vandenberg and Spall and I think November or December. So, you know, there's it, we don't lack information. Um, I think maybe we, we obviously, I mean, organizations like Equal Education uh, who have a broad movement are doing their work in terms of trying to make sure that government uh, listens to the fact that there are these stresses and strains in the education system that are particularly acute at the moment. Um, but I wonder if we shouldn't also start to try to engage with the planning units within the presidency. This might be a key space because, as Ian said, planning is 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 crucial. I mean, one of the things that I'm I've constantly wondered about over the years, having been involved in infrastructure litigation, see court orders, then a failure by government to meet the court order, then a new order, then a, 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 a you know a, a body set up to oversee the order, and so on and so on and so on, and so it goes. Um, and I've I've never been sure whether this was a sign of recalcitrance or incompetence or. You know, it's it's hard to say, but I I do think that there seems to be. A clarity that most of the time it's not a lack of money. It's not a lack of money and that's mysterious. So it, it leads us to think that there is a lack of capacity then. Let's put it that way. I think capacity, lack of capacity can be caused by a lot of different things. Um, but it does appear that even when government commits to doing the right thing, which it has on several occasions, you know, Ramaphosa says again, they're going to eradicate mud schools. Well, goodness me, uh, that has been said before, like every year for the last 10 years, when the original um, litigation on mud schools was brought in 2011, they were, it had already been said for 10 years before that, you know, and government had never said they wouldn't do it. They always said they would, but they haven't. So we've got to get to the bottom of the why not? What is the problem? Why can this not be delivered? And the fact that we saw that the delivery of PPEs and getting fresh water to schools and so on, even, you know, portable toilets and so on, it is worth examining. What did government do around that? Were, were there any successes? Because maybe if we can find pockets of success in rapid service delivery, then we might be able to see how more of that could be done. So which provinces performed better is a worthwhile exercise to, to examine, for example. Um, where did we see even if it was temporary, but where did we see energy and where did we see movement and what was done there and could it be replicated elsewhere? So um, I think, um, you know, some of the interesting things that have been coming out following the monitoring of the nutrition case that was brought in July last year by Equal Education and the Center for Child Law um, is that the Human Rights Commission has been monitoring, equal education has been monitoring. So we've been looking, you know, getting a lot of data coming out of that system, which is also telling us things about the weaknesses and strengths in the nutrition scheme. So I do think that this kind of engagement with the detail is valuable. 
But then how do we, the next question is, so what are we then going to present to government, if, if that's our next strategy, to say, you know, this is what hasn't worked, don't do any more of that. This is what has worked a bit, do a lot more of that. And get them to recommit to deadlines and, um, I mean, you know, the, the possibility of going back to court is always there, but the fact is we've had a lot of victories in the courts, but it doesn't mean that the taps come on and it doesn't mean that we have flushing loos. It, we're still not there. So there's got to be another, there's, you know, we've got to just continue to, to monitor what government does and to hold them accountable in, in all the ways that we can. Thanks, Sam. Ian. What's yeah. your thoughts? Well, uh, uh, don't want to sound too much like a love in here, but I sort of echo what Anne says, and I think it, um, one of the one of the challenges, definitely, I think we as civil society face it, is, as you said, being able to identify good practice, if not best practice, because we're quite good at saying what government maybe shouldn't do, uh, particularly in the human rights field, but it's actually what they can do and what they should do. And you're quite right; you've got to analyse where. Are they, sometimes it's probably a combination uh it is a combination of lack of resources but sometimes we know it's a combination of the failure to spend those resources effectively uh about investing in the human resource side of things as you said the skills the capacity element uh, and whether that's in teachers and we know there's lots of debates about the quality of south african teaching uh, across the board uh but also the administrators the public officials and look i think anybody who works in public service maybe apart from Donald Trump, uh, wanting to actually do things that are malign, wants to actually do bad governance, bad public policy. But a lot of the time it is, as you said, let's euphemistically say lack of capacity. So I think it's learning not just from within South Africa, but from outside South Africa. Um, often I find working in economic, social and cultural rights, you know, the global north can learn a lot from the global south. Um, I think it just in terms of accountability, that is a key issue. And particularly for those of us who are lawyers. And I think you've got to feel as an official that there are some consequences there. Uh, the Indian courts have wrestled with this for many, many decades about how you hold officials accountable. Uh, and I'm not saying holding them all in contempt and sticking them in jail, but certainly there has to be some measure of accountability because, as you said, we end up in this sort of not very virtuous circle of really failing, going back to court, promising to do better, not really doing better, you know, often the court will, will not continue to be seized of the case. I think there is a duty there often on the courts to continue to monitor and be seized of the case. And, and every six months say, well, how are you doing? And why aren't you what you said you would do? So I think that's why people get disillusioned, because whether it's the president saying these things or the minister or people in the, in the provinces, they've heard it all before. Uh, and your kid is still going to a mud school or is going to a pit toilet or has to walk 10 kilometres a day to get to school because there's no scholar transport. And when you get there, there aren't enough textbooks and you're in a class of 70. You say, well, I'm sorry, I've had enough. Time has run out and you need to start sorting some of this stuff out. So I think yeah, we need to play our role. And I know, obviously, it's sort of, you know, again, when I came to work in Africa, you know, this is not a, an unexplored issue. It's such a fertile issue of, uh, of, act of activism and debate. And we're just helping, as Shanila said, to amplify that in a way uh, through what Amnesty can do. Uh, but I think, you know, there is a thing where we need to be working uh, and government needs to be working also with international organisations, United Nations, uh, UNICEF in this case, or other, other agencies to get that international cooperation assistance to deliver a better right to education for kids. Can I add something in there, Shanila, as well? I just want to add to yeah, go ahead. Go um, ahead, what we're chatting about is largely the capacity in, in policy implementation. And one of the things we have in South Africa is such good written documents, but such poor implementation of those documents. Um, and we often see this top-down bureaucratic push that doesn't follow through. Um, and very kind of disenfranchised people on the front line. Um, I would really advocate for enabling and empowering that front line to start pushing back up towards the system and holding that system to account from within the system. I think of our school governing bodies in particular who have constitutional mandates to, to govern their schools, but to also maintain and hold the system to account. Um, and that's a, a remarkable opportunity as well, as long as they are provided with the, the opportunity and the resources and perhaps also the capacity to do so, particularly in some of our, our poorest areas as well. But I think what I'd also like to highlight our role as civil society organizations is 
the, the importance of maintaining that value education as not just a nice to have. And we've seen it with the schools closing on and off, on and off. Here we are, now we're not, let's postpone it by a week. And that, that schools are not a nice to have. Time and time again, this report, the previous research last year by the NITS Cram study has shown that schools aren't just a place of learning or a place of just imparting knowledge. They're, they're, social, they're places of social safety. They are nutritional support systems. Um, we can't just keep looking at these environments as, as a school environments as a second, a second class priority. They are a first class priority and as civil society organizations, we have to keep pushing that to the top of the agenda nationally, especially when SAA comes up. Thanks, Amanda. Questions are pouring in, guys. Um, uh, the next question I have is, if you had the reset button at your fingertips, what are the five aspects of education that you would reset? Government is under pressure, so what resource mobilization is, to, is required to make the reset real? So what are the five aspects of education that you would reset and how would you do it? Uh, who would like to take that question? Go ahead, Anne. Um, well, let me say that I think we've there's been some good research um, into what Spall calls the binding constraints. He says if you don't get these things right in education, um, you just won't get it right. And he he says the most important binding constraint uh, is teacher knowledge. And the second most binding constraint is teacher absenteeism. So if we had knowledgeable, more knowledgeable teachers in the classroom teaching, um, and they were there all the time, and this of course is all pre-COVID. I mean, this is just what we were talking about before COVID came along to make it that nobody's in the classroom. But um, the problem before that was that massive absenteeism amongst teachers and um, you know, poor, poor quality education. So if you're looking at a quality education, and I presume we are, we have to be talking about that, there's no, not much point in having poor quality education, um, then those are your, you start there. And it's an interesting debate about whether infrastructure, to what extent infrastructure is part of a quality education. You know, is that, where do we position it in our, in our hierarchy? Um, but I think there are reasons why First of all, that that um, infrastructure is very important um, for for quality because it, in 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 the new generation of quality education that we're thinking about, you'd have to have electricity. You you must have an internet connection. These things are very important. Um, but I also think that there are human dignity and human rights reasons why we have to get infrastructure right. So it's not, for me, it's not a hierarchy that we can pick and choose. We actually have to do all of these things all at once. So picking your top five is a little tricky if it's a hierarchy. But if it's not a hierarchy, then I can say, I think we could say, let's, let's say five things that all have to be pushed at the same time. Then I think we're talking um, teacher quality, teacher presence, um, good infrastructure, decent infrastructure, um, and safe learning spaces for children. Uh, that's for maybe, depending on whether some of those could be seen as separate or not. So I'll, I'll throw those in as a start. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, it's obviously it's a combination, is it? Uh, if you deliver any public good, it's human resources and physical resources. And uh, you can have the most, I, I accept you can have the most wonderful school buildings. In fact, my own son's school, which was a failing school here in South London, was completely rebuilt and it won actually architectural awards. And it's a great environment for the kids. But if the quality of the teaching was poor, the, 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 the offering is poor and ultimately the outcomes are poor. And again, we haven't got time uh, to get into the debates on, uh, you know, uh, uh, why South Africa again. But I think we already have explored some of it, you know, whether it, Spall has written so much on this, hasn't he, as you said, about poor performing in terms of outcomes on literacy and numeracy. And I know he's got various practical projects to try and address that. Um, but certainly, obviously, uh, you know, South Africa should be doing better on that. So I think, yes, it is a combination. And in fact, we reflect that in the first report about some of the issues around teachers. Uh, but I don't think it's, uh, you know, all the teachers we met, I think some of them are really worn down 
with decades of support, lack of investment. The same with the people in the school governing bodies. I mean, it's a pity Mr. McEnroe can't make the, the call because they've been a key partner for us. Uh, they, could, they helped us to conduct a big survey for the first report. And these are people doing this stuff voluntarily uh, from their communities, trying to give a better chance for their kids and sometimes not even their own kids, but just because they want to help out on governance. So effective governance, how the school is run, how those resources are being spent, but I think also other things, you know, it's a package, isn't it? Scholar transport, um, you know, what is happening with the support for kids when they go home, when they have to do the homework, you know, all of these things that make actually for a holistic approach, as Anne said. So I think the government strategies and plans and the provincial governments have to reflect all of these different issues. And I totally agree, it's not a hierarchy, um, but you've got to have a plan for each. You know, what's my problem with teacher retention? What's my problem with teacher training? Do we need to look at different models of teacher training? Uh, why is it that, uh, you know, we, we don't end up with those good outcomes? So, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's, you know, it's about good governance, uh, ultimately, I think. And it's about how you run these things to actually ensure that you've got the package to deliver the best, the best offerings for the kids. Amanda, any thoughts? Thanks. Yes, thanks, Janelle. Absolutely. Uh, straight off the top of my head, I would absolutely agree with And We need empowered teachers who are passionate and present. Without them, we can't get to the essence of what education is. And that's that moment between a teacher and a learner where education and knowledge is shared. Um, I would agree absolutely at the end. Governance and accountability. Without those two driving factors, how are we going to hold our system to account, our teachers to account, and ourselves to account to making sure that we have a quality education system? And then I bring in a, a, a probably a fourth and fifth one, which is around flexibility and capacity. I think we have got such an incredibly top-down bureaucratic system that, as Ian, as you say, is really driving that, that feeling of feeling quite disenfranchised and, and numbed to the, the systemic issues. Um, we need the flexibility to be creative at a school level, uh, the flexibility to be creative at a system level, to so try things differently. And I think that's where COVID has really highlighted that opportunity, that if we do things differently, we can actually achieve some pretty remarkable things, but not without the right capacity. And there I think that partnerships come in so importantly because there are people who do have the capacity in near and far environments and with digital technologies in places that are available, of course, we can we can start leveraging those partnerships in new and creative ways so that, that the skills are shared, that the capacity is shared, and that ultimately the system is strengthened at multiple levels, whether it's in the classroom to learn how to do new types of learning, whether it's at a governance level to do two types of governance at school and due diligence, um, and whether it's a systemic level where we can look at policy windows and sharing information at um, with various levels of the system. Uh, so those would be, uh, and just to follow up, I mean, I think leadership, uh, and again, yeah. when I went round schools, you could see the difference, even in some of those schools that were really struggling. Uh, the leadership sometimes they were trying to get additional resources, maybe collaborating uh, with local businesses sometimes to get resources in innovation, as you said. Uh, and it was tough, uh, but I really admire those people who kind of stick with it um, because I think the leadership is important. I've seen that again in my own my own experience of being a parent here in London. Uh, leadership can turn a school around, but they but they can't do it on their own. They need the support and the resources of government uh, at different levels to be able to do that. Absolutely. So I have another question. Um, without minimising the importance of key issues like poor infrastructure and lack of safety, does the report consider the emotional well-being of children and their inability to cope with this new normal? Ian, it'd be great because, you know, the question is directed at the report, but it'd be great to hear from Anne and Amanda on this because it's really about, you know, what about the kids? How are they coping? Ian? Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I'll let both of them probably speak more eloquently on this. I mean, I think... Um, report doesn't and I suppose that's where, where you've got to you know we wanted to get more testimonies we got loads of testimonies of children for the first report for learners and that's tend to what amnesty does obviously with the situation it was much more difficult to do that and so we focused on these sort of dry statistics and data but you're quite right uh, the, the, the toll that it's taking on our young people being out of education the social interaction that education uh, gives them uh, and when you look at how the aims of education are framed under the rights of the child, which uh, convention, which Anne knows far better than me, it's not just about the delivery of knowledge, important although that is, and enabling you to get on in life and contribute to society, but it is also about the values 
it instills in you and the opportunity for interaction and all of those skills that we want for our children. So yes, I think children have suffered a lot. It's been a, a terrible consequence of this. And, you know, that, that will also need that support. You know, what is being put in place to help with children's mental health? Uh, what is being done to ensure that children, when they do come back to school, are able to adjust? They can't just hit the ground running again. So yeah, definitely the, the port Sally does, we couldn't address all the issues. I think it's sort of sub, it's implicitly the report, but it is a big issue. I, I totally accept that. And Yes, I, I really do think that this is a very good question, a very important one. Uh, there, are, there are some researchers doing work around this, and I noticed that the new Children's Commissioner in the Western Cape, Christina Nomdo, has made it very much part of her new mandate uh, to consult with children and find out what their experiences are. Um, and um, what I think is coming back from children is that there, uh, there are numerous impacts, but they're all the sense of anxiety, the uncertainty, the living with uncertainty about when do they go back and so on. And I must say that this is actually coming through, um, it's not just a South African issue, but children all over the world are expressing this, um, you know, in, from my, my vantage point as, as a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, we've just come out of a session and I would say every single one of the we met with children from different countries and um it's actually quite hard to get them to talk about anything other than what they've been experienced under COVID. it's almost like everything that happened before they've almost forgotten what the issues were then but now these are this is their daily reality that they're living with struggling with um <laughs> um and so on is really something very difficult for them so um it is an important question, and I think that you know it's something that we can factor in. Um, uh, that that we that as far as possible, we should be trying to find out how children are feeling about going back and what solutions they have as well. Do they have any ideas about what they would like to see? Um, and um, I mean, I noticed last year when we were in the in the phase of should we go back, should we not go back. There were children that wanted to go back and there were children that were anxious about going back. So, you know, there's a, a range of different views. They're not all monolithically saying we want to go back. And some children, um, of course, children who can learn uh, from home are in a very different position. But we know that that's an extremely small number, a small percentage, let's say, uh, maybe quite a big number, but a small percentage of children um, in South Africa. So it's not, in the long term, it's not a solution. I am a believer in trying to get children back into school and keep them in school as far as possible. Thanks, Anne. Amanda? Um, I, I think this is an incredibly important point, and I think we often lose it in the sight of, of trying to work on things that are more tangible, like infrastructure and putting a lesson in front of a learner. Um, I would even go so far to say that we're probably looking at three epidemics. We've well, th three massive outcomes of this COVID, uh, the consequences of COVID. We've seen the economic consequences, we've seen the financial, we've seen the, the the school closure consequences. But we're we're sitting on the brink of a mental health, a major mental health crisis with our learners. Not only dealing with the con the consequences of COVID and the fear and anxiety, but the consequences of not having access to learning, not having access to nu significant nutrition. Uh, potentially being in households where they haven't been safe for an extended periods of time, where school might have been the only places where they where they could get away from potentially abusive uh, family households. And so to, to look at some of the, the, the solutions, we can't just look at improved learning interventions or improved infrastructure. We need to be looking at improved holistic well-being. Uh, at some of our schools, we've had to employ additional two to three social workers just to meet the need. Um, ranging from additional food support, to, but right through a lot of a lot of group therapy, a lot, and that's not just for our learners; it's for our teachers as well. And part of our teacher empowerment, I think, should address the psychosocial issues too. I've just got a question that is, I think, in response to uh, you know Anne's uh, five uh, and Amanda's five important things, and it's around the issue of teach, teacher absenteeism. And the question is, do we know what the reasons are for massive abs uh, absenteeism? Um, is it mental health issues, addictions? What are the reasons behind this? Could someone shed some light? 
Anne, would you like to go first? <laughs> Any light in your side? I'm not aware of any studies that have drilled down deeply into that, any massive studies in the country that, that's dr drilled deeply into it. And I would hazard a guess that it might be a combination of, of several, you know, of, of lots of different factors. Um, it's hard to say. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not really qualified to answer that, but I think it is an important question to be asking ourselves and, and we're talking about capacity building and support. I mean, just something that always reminds, that I always think about, for example, when we look at infrastructure is, if there are no uh, toilets for children, there are also no toilets for mm -hmm. teachers. Um, and I remember visiting mud schools where the teachers would, they'd get to school, they, they didn't live in the village, so they had to drive in, and they would try and stay at school for four hours and cram everything in and then leave. And part of the reason for that was that there were, there were no toilets at the school. Um, so they were trying to fit their day into a kind of possible space where you didn't have to go to the loo. I mean, it's a, it's a real issue that we have to think about. Um, so... Um, you know, I, I think if you if you imagine a teacher in those kinds of environments, then there'd be a lot of reasons why you might not be wanting to be at school. <laughs> so, um, you know, but I'm 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 speaking you know off the cuff somewhat and not not from a very informed position. Maybe Amanda has more. Uh, she she's obviously far more in touch with what teachers are thinking and feeling than I am. And I would absolutely agree. I would absolutely agree with you in terms of the quality of your working environment. Uh, there are a number of health studies focusing on nurses, particularly, and some of the, the reasons for disengaging with quality healthcare. And I think many of those are, are likely translatable to, to the education sector. Who wants to arrive at work when you've got 40 children, 100 children in a classroom, all varying ages, no classroom desks to sit on, a broken window that lets the rain in, and nowhere to go to the loo. Um, they are very simple, basic things when we put them on paper. They shouldn't be as challenging as they have been to solve. Um, I think if we could improve the, the working environments of teachers, we would see a lot more, a lot more interest in coming to school and to teach. Um, I think another aspect of that is good leadership. To Ian's earlier point, if we haven't got leaders, good got good leaders at the forefront showing us how to, to, to be good teachers or how to arrive at school every day. If we have a principal who is running three businesses on the sides and coming maybe once a once a month, we need to be holding our leaders to account as well. Um, the, the the fish rots from the head, but the yeah, we need to we need to make sure that we we've got we've got the right people in place showing us what to do and how to do it. Yeah, I mean I, I mean the this is a contentious issue, and I, and I know it is, but it's not unique to South Africa. I mean, there's high levels of sickness in in UK teaching profession, uh, and I'm not saying that the, the level of absenteeism, because if we, you know, why are they absent? As you said, are they just bunking off, or are they genuinely sick because of some of the issues that are, that Amanda and Anne has raised? And I think, you know, I always say try and understand a bit more and condemn a little less. Um, but I know that you know we've got to you've got to get you won't resolve the issue unless you understand what's causing it. Uh, and also, uh, there are, if there's accountability issues, performance issues, conduct issues, that should be resolved in a proper system uh, through employment processes. If it's not, uh, then you obviously have to think, well, you know, what, it, what is then, what is the existential structural issues that's allowing for too many absenteeism? But I think a lot of it, and as I said, I met many teachers going around when I was doing my first time round, who were just literally worn down but they were still coming in and as Amanda said you know if you're coming into the, that quality of a working environment every day it doesn't exactly motivate you or, or, you know it doesn't exactly motivate you to to come in and to stay and it may be you know and it may contribute to your state of physical or mental health so I think you know, they have to get to the bottom of it they have to study it um, and also we're just seeing a lot of teachers leave early take early retirement teachers but they don't want to stay in the profession because they just don't see a future with all of these issues we've been talking about so you know the government has to again have a plan are they getting enough new teachers wanting to come in or are they going into other professions because they don't see a future for, for themselves as teachers so it's, it's both the entry level and the exit level as well so I have two questions and we're running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to ask both the questions and then maybe ask each one of you to say something to both the issues and maybe do a couple of wrap-up uh, comments 
um, rather than, you know, doing another round. We just won't have time for that. Uh, so I hope that's okay with you, panelists, if I just ask, ask both questions. Uh, so the question, uh, one question is uh, um, somebody who has written saying that, uh, what is my role as an individual social worker to make a difference in the communities? And if it's activism, where do we start? Uh, in the communities. And the second question is around the role of the school governing bodies. It's, a, you know, the question is what role can they and should they be playing in the new normal? So if I could start with you, Anne, and then maybe you could just also do, uh, you know, a, a wrap up, uh, you know, your final thoughts uh, as we go around, if that's okay. Yes, well, let me start with the school governing body issue. You know, the the government, the, 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 the ANC actually decided that they would give school governing bodies quite a lot of policy making power, decision making power. Um, and to an extent, what we've seen in there uh, through that is um, well off schools being able to use their school governing bodies or their school governing bodies are active um, and have gone to court to defend their language policies, this, that, and the other. Um, and when it comes down to poorer schools where there also needs to be a flexing of um, muscle, if you like, um, it's not so easy for those school governing bodies to, to do that. And part of the reason is um, the, the skills that they have and so on. But I do think that nevertheless, uh, no matter um, where they are, parents can still make a difference and school governing bodies can stand up for doing the right thing. And we do see that from time to time where school governing bodies actually do make a difference. They pitch in, they actually physically go and build and do things at the schools and so on. So there is that kind of contribution. But I also think it's a kind of contribution of saying this is not acceptable no more pit latrines we will not allow it and of course we do see sometimes protest action um which is in a sense the community's um way of trying to express their frustration um so if that feeling could be channeled more into holding um the uh, school managers, school management um, hierarchy in, to account, then we might see more action. Um, so perhaps that's, I, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll leave the social work question. I think Amanda will be better placed to answer it. Any final thoughts from you, Anne? You well, done? simply to say that I know sometimes it feels like we're saying the same things all the time. <laughs> um, and that is a little frustrating. But nevertheless, um, I do think that adding knowledge is always useful that whatever whatever our roles are whether we are researchers whether we are activists whether we are litigators mm -hmm. um having information very important so i would like to say uh, that my appreciation to amnesty for this great report and uh, we just need to keep putting more information out there and use it thank you thanks then amanda uh great thanks and i think that ties in quite nicely with what i i wanted to say Regarding both social workers and the SGBs, I think point number one, know your community resources. There is a lot of untapped resources at the community level that will both enable you to do your jobs well um, and enable you to connect the right people so that you can, you can achieve quality education in your schools. From the social worker side, I think don't ever underestimate how important your role is as a community resource yourself um, in sharing information, in linking people to the resources and the support that they need. But I think there's often in the allied health sciences, um, particularly in social work, a lack of focus on gathering the, the, the information you need to advocate. Um, so I would say keep records of how many, how how much support you're having to provide and to who, where the the gaps are, where where the school is being laid down, um, and communicate that both internally and outwardly. Um, uh, the a social worker has such an incredible community role, an important role to play, particularly at this time, because it's often the link that keeps learners connected to school um, and keeps them keeps keeps their heads above water. Uh, for SGBs, I'd say the same thing. Know the roles and responsibilities. Know what your mandate is about what you can and can't do. Um, make sure that you seek and build the capacity you need to make the right decisions. And again, gather the information that you need to 
um, to make the wise decisions, both internally and externally, and share that information externally so that you can drive quality education at your schools through good governance. Uh, my parting shot would be absolutely don't underestimate your own resilience at a school level. Um, and this is an incredible opportunity to drive change. So leverage it, use good quality information. Um, and yeah, let's let's do the reset that we need to do. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Elena. Well, uh, I think pretty much all of us on this call, the speakers, are all something called the voluntary sector. Uh, but I, I'm, not, I'm not a volunteer. I'm paid to do what I do. But when I went around, as I said, the country and met a lot of people who were members of local school governing bodies, I was so impressed. Uh, I mean, we have school governing bodies in the UK, but this is of a different order of things. The level of commitment, the level of engagement uh, it, its something to behold. But they do need, I think, they need support. And, and, uh, and in fact, they themselves are the first to admit support with training, with capacity building. Because as you said, the more, the more active ones, the ones that have the lawyers, that have the accountants on their school governing bodies are the ones that send their kids to the private schools or the, or the, the higher up quintile, uh, better off schools. And so again, that perpetuates inequality, doesn't yeah. it? So what we need is for these people to be supported so they can hold uh, the, the, the school uh, management to account, but they need to interrogate the accounts. They need to be able to establish, you know, what are the areas of, you know, policy that's being put up, being uh, implemented. And that doesn't mean they need to be pedagogue experts, but they do need to have some of these skills. I, I, I also that there can be conflict when they are seen to be overstepping the mark. So we heard that from some school principals, they interfere too much. And then on the other mm -hmm. side, yeah, well, the principal doesn't like us to interfere too much. So you've got to get that balance right. But where it works well, and we did see it working well, then I think the school potentially has can thrive. Uh, and uh, But they do need support. I know there was issues around the overall funding of NASGBs by, by government, and they're finally getting some kind of financial support. And I'm sure that the Secretary General would have spoken about that if he was able to come on the call. Uh, but I do see them as a key actor. That's why we got it. They're not the teachers' mm -hmm. unions. They're not the government. They're somewhere in between. And they represent the parents and they represent the kids. Um, so my final reflections are, as, as I said, um, all, all we can do is try to make a contribution uh, to this debate, and I hope the report will be useful in that. Uh, you know, I know that the National Office through Shinilla and colleagues continue to commit to this work, and that's important. It, it can't be done by me coming and doing stuff in London. It, you know, it has to be owned by the local office, which it is. Uh, and then to go out and do more of this advocacy, remind people, as, as Amanda said, you know, these are not discretionary welfare items. These are rights. These are fundamental rights that's in the Constitution, that's in international law that South Africa has signed up to. And we need to remind the government of that and their duties and that they need to operate with that perspective when they're making any public policy decision. And education is only a few years for most young people. And if they miss out, that's it. And chances can be destroyed. So we've got to, as you said, move quickly on this that sense of urgency. And I know that so many people in South Africa are doing that and they are trying to, as I said, hold the government feet to the fire. I hope the government is listening and that part of the just recovery, they can really address some of these issues, both on the human resources side and on the physical resources side. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, uh, Ian, uh, Anne and Amanda, thank you so much for, for such a, a, a wonderful discussion. I think there's been some really important points. And I think, you know, at the end of it all, it's it's really uh, something that we cannot stop doing. We can't give up. We have to keep on pushing until every child in this country gets the equal education that they deserve. Uh, to ev everyone who has joined this webinar uh, on behalf of Amnesty International, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate appreciated your excellent questions. Uh, this is a continuing dialogue and a continuing conversation, uh, but thank you so much for joining us and uh, please do uh, uh, download our report and if there's, you know, get in touch with us uh, if there's, if you have any questions or, or concerns. Uh, but again, thank you so much to, to the panel. We really appreciate you. Have a wonderful evening and uh, stay safe. You too. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye, -bye. Bye everyone. Bye.